Jeff himself hardly needs any introduction given the success of the Dexter Books and Series, so without further ado, please welcome Jeff. He'll stand here and I'll ask the questions from over there. Thank you. And, you know, actually, if you were going to say some nice things, that I, I could take an introduction. If... <laughs> oh, that's true. Okay. My back is scratched. Okay. Uh, first question. Do you think Dexter's overall success is reflecting a public first and what might be termed vigilante justice? And on a smaller scale, I know this in the later novel, um, the references to very bad speeding drivers and what Dexter would like to do. Yeah, um, did I think the success is affecting what? I didn't quite hear. Whether um, the, um, the success of the books in part is to a feeling in public society about vigilante justice or oh. Boy, um, you know, I, I can't really take responsibility for the whole public sector. Uh, I will say, just because it's a university, I'm allowed to be a little pedantic. Um, he's not a vigilante. Vigilantes kill criminals out of a sense of outraged justice, and Dexter kills people because he likes to kill people. It's a subtle distinction, perhaps. But, um, as to whether it's affected the public attitude, uh, no, I don't think so, because uh, as a careful observer of our uh, global culture, I would have to say that at any given moment in world history, including this one, we're totally freaking nuts. Um, we're all homicidal. Uh, most of us luckily don't act on it. I say luckily because um, I, in my research I've become aware that people who are not sociopaths, um, if they commit murder, it stays with you. And you know, it's almost as if the person you kill curses you because you, don't, you can't leave it behind, you can't forget it. Uh, I'm speaking particularly having learned this uh, from my father who was a wounded combat veteran of World War II. And at the age of 86, which is 60 some years after the war, um, every night of his life he wakes up yelling and fighting the battle again and remembering it. And generally that's what happens. Um, so for someone to become a vigilante killer, you need to be a sociopath first. Um, and you, uh, the new research is, is saying that you're born that way. It's actually most likely, it's not definite yet, but the studies are suggesting there's actually a physical thing in the brain that is different in sociopaths. Did that answer the question? Yep. What a remarkable coincidence. <laughs> You have got three daughters, and for five years you were at home, uh, gathered on father and from male perspective. Is some of that coming out of Dexter now? Um, some of it is. Uh, some of it is in Dexter is delicious. More of it is in the book I'm writing now, which is working title Double Dexter. Um, you really can't help it. When you're writing a series like this, if, if you're a half honest writer, Part of it is kind of like a, a weekly gazette, you know. Here's what's going on in my head, this book. And another part of it is when I opened Dexter's Delicious with the birth of his daughter, uh, I immediately channeled the feelings I had when my first child was born. And so it all feeds in there. And um, it, 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 again, being a, a half-honest writer, you, you, don't, you don't fight it off, you let it come if that's what the little voices in your head are telling you to do. Rachel Hill, um, who was the creator of the Dial uh, Pasco novels, um, once said that the TV spin-offs of his books had deviated quite considerably from the characterization that uh, he had in the novels. But he was quite happy to take the money to run the way. But how do you feel about the quite considerable differences now between the TV series and the novels? <coughs> um, Uncle Ernie, <laughs> can I say that too? Thank you. <laughs> Uncle Ernie once said, um, if you have to deal with Hollywood, uh, go to the city line, throw your manuscript over, wait for them to throw money back, and then run like hell. <laughs> I don't think that's changed. Um, I'm pretty happy with the adaptation, because after 12 years of hard time in Hollywood, I know television is where books go to die. And I have never in my life seen a successful adaptation 
that made the writer of the book happy. Uh, so I was fully prepared to be um, oiled and reamed and uh, amazingly surprised when it turned out as it did. Uh, it's won a bunch of awards and has probably deserved more. I mean, it's a great show. I watch it and I like it. And I'm not sitting there thinking, my baby, oh no, they did that wrong. <laughs> I, I watch it like you would watch, you know, any of the shows you're fond of. So overall, I'm, I'm thrilled. But yeah, they do stuff that I don't agree with from time to time. It's a different medium with different demands. And it's, you know, at every season it's five or six different writers. Um, most of whom I would gamble and have not actually read any of the books, but have instead read what they call the Bible of the show, which lists the plot lines from the seasons before. So, I, I, you know, I, I got no complaints. Um, Michael C. Hall is, is the very picture of Dexter. I can't imagine anyone else doing it. And if the stories go in a different direction, you know, well, so what? I, my stories are still going in my direction. Do you still make any appearances like Hitchcock in these series? Um, I've made one so far, and I had a great time. Um, this is a digression that is not actually answering the question, but I wanted to share my experience. Um, I, I begged, wheedled, and groveled for three years and finally got them to agree to let me have a cameo appearance. And I got out there, oh, they made sure to say, but you pay your airfare. I said, yes, I'll pay. <laughs> so I was not expecting a lot. It was six or seven lines. I, some of you may have seen the part and hopefully not recognized me um, because they say that TV adds 10 pounds and <laughs> this was a seven camera shoot. <laughs> Um, anyway, I got out there not expecting a great deal, and I found, to my complete shock, that I was the first six-line actor in history with his own trailer, <laughs> which I thought was pretty nice. And then I'm standing in the bright Southern California sunlight, and I find the door to the sound stage, which is almost seven paces from my trailer, which I, th I complained about. Um, <laughs> And I step inside, if you've ever been inside a sound stage where they're shooting something, it's pitch black except for one or two lighted areas where they're actually filming. So I stepped in and I closed the door and I'm standing trying to get my eyes adjusted and over here I hear, the creator is here. <laughs> And I thought, I probably heard that wrong, or someone else, you know, it's, it's crazy. So my eyes adjust, I start sneaking around, and I come to a, a, what they call a psych. It's a big fake wall that they project things on. And I stop and looked around, and over here now I hear, that's the creator. <laughs> And uh, I'm starting to think, you know, <laughs> maybe they are talking about me. But I wandered around. I found where they were shooting, and I'm standing there and watching. And a guy jumps up and says, "Oh, why don't you take my chair? You know, sit down, watch." And I said, "Oh, well, thank you." And I sat in a chair, and I look. I notice it's the only chair on the set. And I said, D "Don't you want this chair?" "No, no, no. That's fine." "Oh, well, thank you." And what do you do on the show? And he said, "I'm the director." <laughs> I said, you're the director, I can't take your chair. And he says, oh, of course you can. You're the creator. <laughs> um, so, and I was awarded the ultimate honor on the set, which is that um, he let me call, there's a tradition, the, the next to last shot of the day is called the martini shot, meaning in just a few minutes we're gonna break and we can all have a drink. And he came over to my chair. <laughs> And he said, would you like to call martini shot? And I, I'm nearly crying, because that's never happened before. <laughs> but I said, are, are you sure you want me to? And you can say it with me now. He said, of course, you're the creator. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to go, all right, people, martini shot. And everyone went, he did that good for the creator, didn't he? <laughs> And the only downside to the whole thing was that for two weeks afterwards, I went around forgiving people. But it was... <laughs> does uh, Henry and Paula White read her manuscripts? And if she does, do you take her class? <laughs> you can't stand it, can you? You look at a happy working marriage, and you just have to get in there and try to wreck it. <sighs> Yes and no. 
She almost always reads the manuscript before it's done because I almost always paint myself into a corner. And I've learned that when I'm really stuck, especially on some plot point, the two simple words that will always get me out of it are, Hillary, help. <laughs> and she's, she's absolutely the best I've ever seen with uh, plot structure, things like that. In fact, we were um, a writing team because of that um, before we even started dating. And um, in fact, we put off dating for a couple of years because you can always find a girlfriend or boyfriend, but a good writing partner is impossible. So she always does see it. The only exception being the new book, Dexter is Delicious, which f for whatever reasons, um, I sat down to write it on day one after I had sort of an outline. and. I'd had a smile on my face ever since I thought of the title, which I think was down here the last time I was down here. I thought, Dexter is delicious. <laughs> <laughs> and it stayed like that the whole book. I was done in under two months with no rewrites, and that's never happened before. And I now understand, because of the trouble I'm having with the current book, that it happened that way because God is punishing me. <laughs> but Hillary sees all the other books and always comments, and about half the time I take her advice, because it's always good advice, but about half the time she makes me mad by offering me that particular bit of advice and I come up with something I think is better. And it never is, it's just different, but <laughs> that's the way these things work and she's used to it now. Um, another segue to Hillary. Um, last time we were here, you said you might write a next book set in Australia. Cold if I could bring my Wi-Fi. So maybe that would be a good idea. She's already pissed off that I'm not bringing her and cold. So we'll be now that long set. It was in this room um, a year and a half ago that someone said, Is Dexter ever coming down under? <laughs> and I said, you know, why not? It would be a great title, Dexter Down Under. And everyone leaped to their feet and yelled and applauded, and the publisher was in the back of the room. And she came down and waved her hand for silence and said, if you write that book, I promise I'll bring you back. So I, I am thinking about it. It won't be the next book, because that's almost finished, but it could happen very soon. I would have to make a research trip, as I understand, to Adelaide, but... <laughs> You see, honey, the local humor always gives you the same. Ali Prabhu was with you in Perth, came to camera on Tuesday and said, there's no upside to being a celebrity. How does it feel with next to so famous? You presume you can walk down the street and recognize it. Frankly, I love it. Uh, I have what I like to call an Edgar Rice Burroughs complex. Okay, university crowd. Who knows who Edgar Rice Burroughs is? And about four hands go up. This is exactly what I'm talking about. If you go anywhere in the world and say, have you ever heard of Tarzan? People will go, am I right? Edgar Rice Burroughs wrote Tarzan. Um, I feel like I'm in the same position as the guy that created Deck, the creator. Um, and I like it. Um, I did 12 years in Hollywood. I watched fame up close. I know a lot of so-called famous people. And I believe you have to be, either you have to be damaged to want it, or if you don't necessarily know what it entails and you get it, you become damaged. Nobody can survive it. Um, Aboriginal people all over the world, when they encounter the camera for the first time, um, don't want their picture taken because they believe the camera steals their soul. Hollywood kind of proves that. <laughs> uh, no, the next novel that um, Nexus brother is going to play a larger role in the future. Is that likely? Um, he does come back in this book. For those of you who are shocked because uh, he was killed on the TV series. Um, <laughs> I might also comment that everywhere I've gone for the last year, I find heavily armed crowds waiting for me um, because I killed Rita. <laughs> and I didn't. She's still alive in the books. <laughs> At a certain point, 
Oh, I was, there's some children here. I said I was going to keep it clean, but it, at a certain point it becomes a urinating contest. And uh, my sister used to have this big golden Labrador that had to pee on every tree wherever he went to mark his turf. And sometimes I feel like the writers on the show are doing that. Um, I sent them a, an email when I was writing this book and saying, Dexter and Rita are going to have a baby girl named Lillianne. And two weeks later, there's an announcement from the network, Dexter and Rita are going to have a baby boy, Harrison. <laughs> so, you know, maybe it had nothing to do with it, but sometimes I get the feeling like they're, they're you know, they're trying to pee on more trees than I can. Um, I, it, I really liked the two characters that they've killed so far, at, both as people and as actors. Julie Benz, who played Rita, is a, is a really nice girl. And some people see her um, and go, oh my god, she's beautiful, she must be an asshole. But no, she's really nice. And um, she kind of, she did a thing that told me what a kind of actress she is. On the show, you may find this hard to believe, on the show, she deliberately planes down her face a little. She's much more beautiful in person than she is as Rita, which to me is the mark of a great actor. You know, the, the part doesn't call for the most glamorous woman who ever lived. It calls for the girl next door. And she did everything she could to make, it, make herself look like that. Um, so I miss her. I miss uh, Eric King, who played Sergeant Dokes. Um, I was, I was closer to him than a lot of the other actors, and we exchanged emails from time to time. And I was sorry they killed him. I'm not allowed to kill him in the books, because he's my editor's favorite character. <laughs> And, and I will just say, you know, shameless plug, if you haven't read Dexter's Delicious yet, it has, I think, my favorite dope scene of all time in it. A couple of questions, depending on what we're going to throw down to you. Um, first of all, do you still play a rock band? I was playing full time in a working band, which means two or three nights a week, I would get home at between 3 and 4 a.m. And this is very difficult if your writing time is between 3 and 6 a.m. Uh, it didn't leave a whole lot of time, and it was just too much. I couldn't handle both. Um, I have an open invitation to play with the band whenever I want, and I just did a fantastic event uh, two weeks ago, or three weeks, right before I left. There's a band called The Prophets in the U.S. And in the 60s and 70s, they were the backup band on the road for all the great Motown acts. I mean, Otis and, and the Wilson Pickett and you know, all of the greats from Motown. So I got to play with them. And absolutely, I'm getting shivers thinking about it, because there was a horn section, of course, too. It's an eight-piece band. I got to get up on stage and sing Shout with the prophets, which just, I thought, you know, take me now, it doesn't get any better. <laughs> so I can play with them when I want, I, I really don't have a lot of time lately. Um, how important is your social background, you mentioned that in Perth, mm -hmm. and if you ever were killed, do you wear anything on <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to reveal my Scottish background by telling you, if you're wearing something under it, it's a skirt. <laughs> it's not a kilt. Um, I don't, know, I don't know if my curly hair comes from the Scots side. I don't know if my stubbornness and bad temper and cheapness comes from the, the Scots side. I do know it from probably both sides, but I know that the Scots side of my family had a reverence for the written word. And I grew up, um, I used to be able to say the whole thing of a wee cow and timorous beastie. <laughs> and, um, my grandfather would always say things like, Ach, man, you're killed, Angus, a bit of a braise you to nicht. <laughs> and I learned from the other side of the family the, the great joke, how does a Scotsman laugh? Hardy har har. <laughs> so I, it's been an influence, but I, I don't know. I, I think you probably have the same experience here with ethnic backgrounds. It's after a generation or so in the new country, it's the fact that they're your parents and what they're like more than it is that they're Scots or Irish or German or whatever. But it, it did affect me enough to know the thing about the underpants. Yes. Well, now for a W, the audience, we've got a lot of so um, if you'd like to put your hand on the mic, you do hand on Thank you. Um, so I was wondering if you could tell us about the 
Repeat the last part. Do I have it? <laughs> particularly in light of the new research I was talking about earlier, where they say it's a physiological difference. I suspect serial killers, and certainly psychopaths, sociopaths, exist everywhere. Um, I know they're here in Australia, just, you know, aside from the cheap joke about Adelaide. Um, when I was here last time, I was on a panel with a psychologist, a psychiatrist, um, and it, 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 like the, anyway, we called for questions at the end, and this little hand goes up in the back, and a woman, I, I couldn't see much, I could just tell she seemed elderly and frail, and she said, what should you do if you think you're living with a serial killer? <laughs> Well, that's the exact reaction she got. Everyone laughed and went very funny. And uh, I think the psychiatrist made, you know, a, a funny comment, and we moved on. Um, now, at the top, Brendan and I had a system worked out where if someone buttonholed me for longer than a minute and I was fidgeting, he would come over and say, all right, I'm sorry, we have to go. Thank you very much, and lead me away. After the event, the little lady was waiting for me. And she buttonholed me, and I'm starting to go, mm -hmm, yes, isn't that interesting? But then she told me her story. And she said, uh, I was married for 58 years to a man, and he was never violent to me or to the children. But after he died, the police said I was very lucky. I, and I said, oh, why is that? Well. They found 12 human skeletons under our house. Now you've got my reaction again. <laughs> and I'm going, oh my God, are you sure? Well, he was never bad to me, but I knew something wasn't right. And I'm going, how did you know? And Brendan said, all right, mate, time to go. Sorry, we've got to, no, no, shut up, shut up. <laughs> This, is, this has stayed with me in the, the last year, and I'm haunted by this image of this little old lady living with someone she suspects is a serial killer who's not bad to her. And as she pointed out at her age, in, in her day, you don't walk out on your husband, especially if he's not bad to you, if he's a good provider, all of that. And God, what a story. Oh, my God. <laughs> There's over here, yeah. I'm curious about the genesis of the Dexter character. Um, were you researching serial killers and the problem of evil and then conceived of Dexter afterwards, or did the character just come to you? Um, the, the two answers. One of them is a set piece. If you've heard it, I forgive you if you put the iPod on when I started. Um, it was not necessarily the problem of, of good and evil, but the problem of situational ethics that the world has become a place where everything is gray. And if we come down and say, you should never do that, we always add, except unless, you know, if, then it's probably okay. And um, I don't know, it, it was making me a little nuts. And I still don't know if I'm right or wrong that there really should be some absolutes, but that's part of what I'm exploring with the series. It's a question that, that intrigues me, sometimes even obsesses me. Uh, so it's beyond good and evil, and I'm not using the title there. Um, it's the question of uh, our relation to good and evil and how we conceive of any act, whether we can ever conceive it absolute. Uh, does that make sense? 
probably a coincidence again. Um, here's the set piece. You can put the iPod things in if you've heard it. Where I got the idea was that I was invited by a civic group, the Kiwanis, uh, who's like the Rotary here. Uh, I was invited to give a speech at the weekly business luncheon, something about you know, why you should read at least half a book once in your life. <laughs> and I'm sitting at the head table very nervous because this is not a friendly room if, you know, you know all the letters of the alphabet. And <laughs> I'm looking out and I'm seeing insurance salesmen and realtors and because it's Florida bail bondsmen and uh, they're smiling at each other horrible fake smiles and shaking hands too hard and throwing out business cards and talking with food in their mouth which I was raised to believe is wrong and the idea just popped into my head <laughs> serial murder it's not always a bad thing <laughs> Um, so I started taking notes on the little napkins, little tiny square cocktail napkins, I guess. And I went home with a stack of them with it had pretty much the outline for the first book. Hi, Jim. Hi, Jim. Where, oh, there you are, okay. Um, I was just wondering about your supporting characters. I mean, I can see where you'd start if you decided to write a novel about a serial killer, but how do you get them to flesh out? I, I wanted the supporting cast to kind of look like America and I always start, if not the lead character, then one of the, the main second characters as a very strong female figure uh, because I was raised by a very strong mother and possibly even stronger older sister. Um, and it's always been something that I regard as positive, which is good because I have three daughters. Um, the character of Deborah is based on a really good friend of mine who was actually a Miami police homicide sergeant. And she's the one, I think this was in the first book, Darkly Dreaming Dexter. Uh, there's a joke, this is the, the joke came from her. I said to her one day, I, just wondering, do uh, real police ever use funny nicknames like they do in books and TV? And she said, yeah, they do. And I said, oh, do, do you have a nickname? She goes, yeah, I got a nickname. I said, what is it? And she says, it's Einstein. I said, wow, is that because you're smart and you solve the problems? And you, you, you know, you always get the, your man and so on? And she said, no. It's because they say, if my tits were brains, I'd be Einstein. <laughs> so that, that's authentic cop humor for you there. And I've, I've learned from some Aussies I've met that it's the same here. Uh, <laughs> and the other characters, uh, I, I don't know, they, they, well like Dokes, for example, a, a really strong presence. He's based on a friend of mine. Um, Masuoka, who they call Masuka, on, um, on, on the TV show because too many vowels makes them nervous. <laughs> uh, I, there's an old joke about Hollywood that um, I worked for a long time as what they call a reader. And I would read a book or a movie script and give the producer a short précis on what the plot and characters were like. And it had to be three pages or less fewer. And our joke was, if it's over three pages, when the producer reads it, his lips get tired. Uh, there's, there's a lot of truth to that. Um, but Masuoka, what I love about him, and it, it's maybe a moment frozen in time that's gone past now, but we never know what he's really about. And there are certain indications that maybe he's gay, because he did go to a party dressed as Carmen Miranda. Uh, and then there are certain uh, indications that he's like a, 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 a pornography addict, and we don't know whether it's straight or gay or in between or bi-curious. And I really love that, and I never want to resolve it. Um, Let's see, who else is in the supporting cast? Captain Matthews is based not so much on police I know, but on political figures I know. Um, whoever's at the head of the organization, no matter where or what kind it is, they're there because they're good at politics. 
So I, I put in a little bit of everything and I, I'd like to put in as many different types as I can. Did that answer the question? So, so not so much. All right. well, what, what do you want? Come on. <laughs> I yeah. Oh, but I mean, I haven't actually read your books, so much. Get out, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> but I like the TV series, and I'll turn everyone I, I know onto the TV series, so I'll probably turn them onto the books after by the time you sign them. But I'm asking the question if you and a friend of yours, really close friend, turn out to be a dexter character, that's killing bad people, I'm always intrigued to see what they say to them as the creator. What, if, if you knew someone who turned out to be like the character you created, how would you feel about that? Would they It's a pretty good question, and you know, if I was giving prizes out tonight, I'd, I'd like to give one for new questions, and that, that genuinely qualifies. Uh, I don't know. I think you have to you have to be in that moment to know for sure. I will tell you, I've had a friend. Um, <laughs> I believe. Every man has one type of alcohol that he must never touch. Uh, in my case, apparently, <laughs> it's gin. And apparently, when I drink gin, I get mean. I tend to think of it as funny, but... <laughs> anyway, for my father, uh, it's rum, which breaks my heart, because I love dark rum, and I'm always offering him some. He was, as I said, a vet or combat veteran. He was in the Marine Corps, and he was promoted three times. And each time he went out to celebrate and drank rum and ended up in the stockade and being busted back down to private. <laughs> in the case of this particular friend of mine, it's tequila. <clears throat> and uh, three times in the last four years, he's called me late at night, can you come bail me out? Tequila again? Yeah, I'm sorry. So one night when I was with him and I couldn't stop him, he had a couple of shots of tequila and I'm like, oh crap, here it comes, another bar fight. But after a couple of shots, he leaned over and this is a huge guy and he looked me in the eye and he said, tell me the truth. I said, of course, what? And he said, is Dexter based on me? <laughs> This is like when your wife says, do these pants make my butt look big? <laughs> There's no right answer. <laughs> and so um, I, I sort of wiggled out of it. Calm down, let me get you some scotch, you know, so anything. <laughs> but I do wonder what he meant by that. And I wonder in light of your question, if I do have that friend and don't know it. <laughs> One of the alarming things about psychopaths is that they are better at being us than we are because we go on intuition and they go on study and they've watched and they know because they've studied it what's the right response in most situations which I think is clear in the way I write Dexter but the rest of us occasionally will miss something you know maybe you were sick in school that day maybe your mom didn't tell you that one whatever they don't miss and whenever a serial killer is called, it's a cliche, you know. Oh, I can't believe it, he was so nice. He always helped with the groceries, fed the cat when I was away, whatever. He's always a perfect person, better at it than we are. So I'm willing to bet the ranch that all of us have a friend or at least an acquaintance who's a sociopath. And with any luck at all, we don't know it. Okay, um, I'm teaching crime to some high school students. Most of the high school students I know you don't need to teach. <laughs> <laughs> and you said before that it's, uh, it's a very um, cloud and moral and ethical area. Mm -hmm. is, uh, once again, I've seen all the TV series that I've read the new books. I started reading one of the new books and some of the TV series I've watched. It was kind of brilliant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I want to think you should see a proper due attention by reading, by reading after I've actually got the duties out of my head. But in terms of that kind of moral and ethical area which Jason goes into, a lot of crime on TV, like Google Minds and even so much versus Jack, which is that our heroes on TV crime are these really unethical characters in a sense. Do you think 
feedbacks and new direction like crime as a genre is heading as opposed to kind of like this more Oh, boy, I, you know, I, I don't know. If I thought that it really was heading that way, I'd try to take credit for it. Um, you know, there's always been the so-called anti-hero, and that's, that's been popular, I think, since Aeschylus. Um, and it, it goes in waves, and it, you know, it comes and goes and comes back again. And new directions in TV, in my experience, mean, oh, Here's a 20-year-old show that people have forgotten about. Um, the, the big hit this season in the U.S. was Hawaii Five-O, which is the 30 years and people have forgotten about it. So um, I, I think it's always going to be a dramatically attractive area to explore because there's a whole bunch of tensions in there that, uh, that any half-decent dramatist can play with. Uh, you know, the, nation, the notions of conventional good versus evil as opposed to the more compelling argument of real good and evil, which is at the heart of Dexter, too. You know, the, the guys that Dexter kills are people who have slipped through the hands of justice, and they're guilty as hell. And if they stay alive and at liberty, they're going to kill more kids or more women, uh, and Dexter kills them instead, and that crime stops. Now, if he was a conventional hero, uh, like his sister, he would have to stand at the jailhouse door and wave bye-bye to the pedophile. So it's a lot more interesting, if nothing else, and that's something that always will appeal to the dramatist. Pleasure. Is the end in sight for Dexter? Um, will the end of the Is that turned off? Can you? Is the end in sight for Dexter? <laughs> there we go. Is the end in sight for Dexter? According to whom? Um, according to me, uh, I may have mentioned earlier that I'm stuck on the book I'm on, and it seems to happen every third book I get stuck. And my solution usually is, I'll bash his head in with a brick, throw the body in Biscayne Bay, and Cody will take over the family business. Um, this, for some reason, my agent and my wife are never convinced with that. Uh, I don't plan ahead at all, not even one book ahead, so I don't know. Um, but I have a picture in my head that someday, uh, do, does everybody know the Alec Guinness film, uh, uh, Kind Hearts and Coronets? Yes. Yeah, great film. Um, he, in the course of the film, kills 30-some people who are between him and the title, the earldom. And at the end of it, he's sitting in the jail cell having been caught, and he's written his memoirs describing each and every murder. When someone comes in and says, you're free, <laughs> you're, you're acquitted, you can go. And he's yahoo, he dances out, he's riding away in a carriage, and then he goes, I left the manuscript in the jail cell. <laughs> For some reason, I've always had that kind of picture of Dexter's end. Um, it's, it's kind of the, the same thing. Now, when will it come? Uh, I'm under contract for another book or so. Um, I know that the TV series will have at least one more season, possibly two. Uh, in fact, uh, I've added a line to my little girl's bedtime prayers. At the end, she always says, and please, God, don't let Michael C. Hall get bored too soon. <laughs> but um, the end will come someday. And if it comes because nobody else wants to read it, that's fine. You know, I'll move on and I'll get a job stocking shelves at Walmart. And another way it could come is if I feel like I'm phoning it in. Do you have that expression here? If, if it's not the quality it should be. Because I've seen a lot of good series uh, where eventually the author gets tired and it's the same yawners, the same jokes, the same situations and they're obviously, you know, typing while watching TV, you know, oh, Oprah's on, I'll get two chapters done. So, if that starts to happen to me, I, I'm not going to write anymore of, of Dexter. Um, Where are you? Oh, gotcha. Your, as part of your research for your books, have you interviewed serial killers? And yes, was there anything about anyone in particular that you might have been spooked by or how do you find writing sorts of things and, and the murders and the deaths? As to have I interviewed serial killers, probably, but not knowingly. Um, I, I have that suspicion about a couple of people I talked to. Um, certainly a couple of mercenaries, 
uh, which are maybe legitimized serial killers. And the reason they're mercenaries is that they have that bump in the brain. It doesn't bother them. They're not going to have dreams like my father. Um, what was the other part of the question? Well, if you had actually interviewed any serial killers, had any seen Yeah. As far as I know, I haven't. Uh, I did a, a lot of research. And at a certain point, I According to psychologists I've talked to, I've clicked into it and I understand it. Um, never from the inside because, you know, I, I, I cry too much when something bad happens on the evening news. I can't watch a story about bad things happening to kids. Um, so, you know, hey, good news, I'm not a sociopath. But um, as far as I know, nobody has actually said, by the way, I've killed 17 people, shall we talk? And if it happens, I'm inclined to think I would say, uh, I have an urgent appointment, but thank you. <laughs> the thank you is very important, too. <laughs> gotcha. Well, uh, I'm sorry, do you have uh, a greed? A belief? Uh, do you think that the writer has, has a mission, a responsibility, responsibility? If you do believe that, what do you think is your responsibility uh, towards the society or yes. towards the humanity? This is a wonderful question, and I should do more university gigs, because I almost never get new questions, and I think I've had four or five tonight. Um, I have to start by saying I'm a, a dedicated neurotic, and I think I would even be a happy person if I could believe the standard cliché that writing is something worthwhile, that it lifts up the human spirit in some way. I, I find it very hard to believe that. Possibly it's my background in comedy and hearing all the old Starkers, oh, sorry, um, Starker is, is a Yiddish slash comedy word for like a big caliber guy, you know, one of the old time hardliners. Like Jerry Lewis is a Starker, okay? And I hear his voice, and I worked for Steve Allen for four years, and I hear him and all the others going, you know, we bring laughter into the world, and it's such a blessing just to laugh, and God is smiling on you because we made you laugh. And that's the voice I hear when I try to convince myself that writing is worthwhile. So it's very hard. I do have one experience, and it was with a book before Dexter, where a lady approached me at a, a signing, and she was one of, I think, four people. So, hey, thank you, this is a big improvement. Um, <laughs> And she dove her hand into her purse and pulled out a wrinkled, stained piece of paper. And she opened it up and she asked me to sign it. And it was a quote from one of my books. And I said, this is, you know, kind of worn. And she says, I carry it with me everywhere. And whenever I feel really bad, I take it out and read it and I feel better. Um, <laughs> Here comes my non sociopath moment again, because yeah, I, I messed up just thinking about it. I don't get a lot of moments like that for some reason with Dexter. Uh, <laughs> coincidence? I don't know. I don't think I have a creed about writing and improving humankind. I don't... I don't want to go all dark on you here, but I don't know if it's possible to improve humankind. I think we are what we are, and we're going to evolve at our own pace no matter what happens. And like everything else, uh, you have Ted Bundy on one side and Mozart on the other, and all the rest of us somewhere in between. And um, the more I think about it, the more I come back to Brendan Bayhan, one of my favorite writers, who said simply, every cripple has his own way of walking. And that's all of us. Did that answer the question? Good. I know I rambled a bit, but that's as close as I can come. Thank you. It's a good question. Where, where if you, yeah, gotcha. Okay. Um, does it ever worry you that somebody might start emulating your killer, start taking ideas from any of your books? Uh, no, and a lot of people ask that. And my response is that my teenage daughter is a huge Harry Potter fan. Um, she's read all the books several times, and she's seen all the movies a dozen times, and she has yet to acquire magical powers. <laughs> Which, I, I might point out, really pisses her off. Um, I, I catch her now and then going, Dadum Vanishium! <laughs> but, um, 
And because I'm neurotic, I did check it out, and every single psychologist, psychiatrist, police person, counselor, everyone I checked with said, no, it's a stupid idea, it can't happen. You're either born a sociopath or you're not, and reading a book or watching a TV show cannot make you one any more than my daughter can get magic powers from reading Harry Potter. It can't happen. I'm glad I'm really definite about it, because it's one of the few things I am that definite on, but I, I'm, I'm sure of it. Can you? Yeah. Um, I love reading about dogs when he comes in the, in the book. Um, how do you get an idea for how dogs is going to appear? Because he's a bit limited in what he can do. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and, you know, and the power has moved from dogs having power to Dexter. How do you, does he just pop up at an opportune time or do you plan? Um, I try to plan at least one good dog scene in each book because, as I said, my editor loves him. Um, and generally speaking, if there's a rewrite at all in the book, it's to put in another dog scene because, as I said, my editor likes him. So uh, other than that, um, I forget about him for long stretches of time. Um, but I think I'm making up for it. First of all, in Dexter is Delicious, which, as I said, has my favorite dog scene for a long time. And in the new book that I'm working on, Double Dexter, um, in which he plays a more active part, because the job they've given him uh, you know, on the police force at this point is, uh, I forget, it's something like administrative personnel superintendent, something he can do until he's qualified for the, the pension. And he happens to be in the exact spot um, that can block Dexter at a crucial time in the book, which I, I won't say more about. But So he's back in that book, too. Yes? Hi, Jeff. Um, have you, uh, are you satisfied with the way the show has represented the duality of the character? Do you think perhaps the show has humanized him too much, or the other, the other way, the opposite of that? I do think, from time to time, uh, he's too humanized. I do think um, I've stuck in very consciously in the books to um, if he shows some human characteristic, it surprises him. Whereas on the TV show, he seems to be seeking it. And because I've been on the road almost constantly since July, I have not seen all of season five. But my impression, and it's a whole new staff of writers, who as my agent says, these guys are not known for their sense of humor. Um, it's my impression that they're leaning too far towards melodrama right now. Uh, it's still a terrific show, but it's, it's leaning precariously over the fence, in my opinion. Uh, someone told me it gets better in, like in mid-season, in season five, but that's my, been my impression. So the short answer, yes. Yes. Um, my age is a pretty convenient place for Dexter because he can go 30 miles offshore and dump the remains of right. his vendors. <coughs> was he always going to be based in Miami or did you contemplate putting him in another city in the United States? Um, I've, as an intellectual exercise since book one or two, I've thought about it and wondered what would happen in New York. Um, for that matter, what would happen in Sydney? Uh, I don't know, uh, but I can't, uh, I can't picture him as well anywhere else but Miami. Part of that is, you know, Miami's my hometown. That's where I grew up. And, and this just hit me for the first time. Maybe it's because, you know, a, a demon in your own backyard is a little scarier. I don't know. But it's also such a wonderful contrast, you know, for all the beautiful people in their thongs and roller skates and to have a monster unknown stalking among them you know, with a beautiful pastel sunset in the background. I really like that. And as I may have mentioned once or twice in the books, um, just driving anywhere in Miami, you really get, you know, that kind of rush that only contemplating homicide can give you. <laughs> Jeff, your daughter said you have a wonderful pedigree of uh, writing yeah. the arts. I was wondering if any one of them have um, shown a talent in, in writing them. Um, tragically, yes. <laughs> Uh, the middle one at the moment um, has just won second place in a statewide poetry competition. And she recently showed uh, my wife and I the first chapter of a book that she sort of came up with. Um, my wife and I are very different in some ways. Her first response was, 
where did you steal this? <laughs> and my first response was, oh Christ, another generation. <laughs> It's, she's a wonderful writer, uh, and I say that uh, with full knowledge that a lot of dads would say that about their kid, but she, the second place award is, is some proof of that. She's, she's very good. Um, luckily, the oldest one uh, can't write a sentence. Um, she's, she's about to graduate with a degree in genetics, and I'm incredibly proud of her because her part-time job for the last two years has been um, now my lips are going to hurt. <laughs> She's harvesting mitochondrial DNA from pig testicles and turning it into stem cells. <laughs> Just by way of contrast for writers, my part-time job in college, washing dishes. <laughs> So she's out of it. The youngest one, it's hard to say. She's, um, she's a great ballerina, uh, but she's only seven, so a lot of things could happen. Time for one last question. Make it a good one. Um, you seem to know a lot about sociopaths and psychopaths. Yes. And by the way you present it, it seems as though they're more prevalent in society than we think. Um, a lot of research has been showing that these behaviors are more prevalent in society even though pure psychopaths or sociopaths per se, I don't know if they're more prevalent in society. Correct. Do you think that, uh, is this backed by your research that there's an increasing trend of pure psychopaths or sociopaths? And do you think that um, it's actually an evolution of humanity to show more sociopathic, psychopathic behaviors? Um, I, the first, the, to answer the last part first, I don't think it's an evolutionary step. I believe that in the past it hasn't been as noticeable. And in a way it's a good thing because there's been too much, you know, up until 150 years ago the rule of thumb was kill the stranger everywhere in the world. We're past that for the most part. So people live longer, there's not quite as much violence, there's a bigger population, they're going to stick out a little bit more. For the first part of the question, uh, I was under the impression from the research I'd done that it was a very low percentage in the population. Um, the last time I was in Australia and I was talking to a forensic psychologist and we were very chummy. Um, he really liked Dexter, which helps if you want to be my friend. <laughs> and um, he said to me, you know, mate, there's a lot more of them than you think. <laughs> I said, what do you mean, like five to six percent? Could be psychopaths? He said, twenty percent. <laughs> I said, holy mother of God, where are all the bodies? <laughs> and he said, well, they don't all become killers. You know, a sociopath, garden variety sociopath, will have no problem about killing if it's necessary. But there's still, to set, to set someone into that path of being a serial killer, there's still necessary, A, the physiological difference, and B, a traumatic event early on that puts them in that path. Now the rest of the sociopaths can grow up to be quite normal. And this guy I was talking to said, um, when I said, where are the bodies, he said, well, you know, most of them go into business. <laughs> and I wondered if he was kidding, and then just then there was the, the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, and I watched the interview with the CEO, and I went, bingo. <laughs> So I still think the best description, if it puts this across to you the way it did to me, my work is done. John D. MacDonald, a, a great American Florida noir writer, the grandfather of all Florida writers, once said that a sociopath, he called them furniture people, and it's as if you, assuming you're not one, um, you have your favorite easy chair and you get really excited during the football match and break the footrest and you go, Shh, now I gotta get a new chair. That's the way a sociopath feels when his wife dies. Oh crap, now I gotta find another one. Um, they don't have any kind of feeling, any kind of empathy for other hu no sense of awareness that other people exist in the same way that they do. And again, looking around us, you'd have to say that probably is a lot more prevalent than, than I might have thought. Did that answer the question? Good, because that was the last one, apparently. So. <laughs> just, before, uh, just a quick um, thank you to Jen for asking the question about 50 partners. I'm very successful there. Um, he's been as insightful as ever as he was last time. 
and we do hope you will come back again with Dexter down the road. I would and love to. And I'd say to those people who are in the audience who only watch the TV series, now is the opportunity to buy the books and actually read the books and get them signed. So on your behalf, we all thank Kevin and Thank you. Thank you.